Hey guys, Pastor Tanner here. Many of you guys saw that on Sunday we were not able to get the stream working and we were not able to get the sermon recorded, so we lost it. Now, I would have normally just went on with my week, but many of you reached out and asked if I would please record the sermon because you keep up week to week and you don't want to be missing that sermon. So, this is going to be my attempt to deliver my sermon again from my office and do one take, no edits. It is what it is, okay? Let's go ahead and jump right in. So this passage is Hebrews 9, 11 to 28, and I'm preaching a two-part sermon on this. So the first one we preached, we talked all about tabernacle themes and different ideas, but there was a particular theme that was mentioned that I never went into, and that was the theme of blood. And so I wanted to wait for this week to go ahead and treat the theme of blood. I've entitled the sermon, Why Bloody Sacrifices? You know, blood is one of those things that is really out of vogue with our day and age. People look at blood and they wonder, why all this gore? What's going on here? Well, the fact of the matter is that blood is a very important topic for us to treat when it comes to the Bible and when it just comes to life in general. Down through the history of humanity, really blood has had a special significance. And so today is my attempt to go ahead and help us to understand a little bit about the significance of blood and why there are all these bloody sacrifices. I don't think that it's the God of the Old Testament just being, you know, out of touch, that he's angry and vindictive and he's, you know, just trying to kill all of these people and I don't think that's it at all. Instead, I think there's a very special significance to the idea of blood, and we're going to see it in our passage here this morning. So we're going to be going through Hebrews 9, 11 to 28, but I already treated many of these verses. When I go through these verses, I want you to focus especially on verses 12 to 14 and verses 18 to 22, because those are ones that especially talk about blood. Let's go ahead and jump in. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all of the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the high places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Let's pray. You, our Lord and our God, are holy. Magnify your great name here this evening. Lumen our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that we might hear by faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. There's a particular Germanic myth that has actually been around for quite a long time. And this myth or legend is based on the topic of Faust. 
okay? This is Johann George Faust around the 1400s, 1500s era. And Faust is this character who is highly successful, and yet he's very dissatisfied with his life. This particular German myth had many different iterations, but by far the most famous iteration was done by Goethe. This is Wolfgang Goethe, and he put together this whole understanding of Faust over a long period of his life. It took him many, many years. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe actually took decades to compile his version of Faust. But it was well worth it because many consider Faust to be his greatest work and to be absolutely timeless. The Faust story is one that we all have heard in many different forms and iterations. This is the classic sell your soul to the devil type of story, okay? Faust is dissatisfied with his life. He doesn't like the direction things are going. Yeah, he's famous. Yeah, he's successful. But ultimately, he is dissatisfied with everything that's going on. And so he actually wants to go further with his life. And he's willing to sacrifice a lot in order to do that. The Satan figure in Faust is Mephistopheles, and Mephistopheles actually appears to Faust knowing that he is very dissatisfied with his life, and there's an exchange between the two of them. There's an interchange, okay? Mephistopheles wants, in order to give Faust all of this power and all of this fame and all of this authority, he wants something from Faust. And there's this exchange going back and forth. They decide that they're going to go ahead and have Faust sign away his soul to Mephistopheles. Here is Faust's language. He's getting ready to sign and he asks this question. Shall I with chisel, pen, or graver write? Thy choice is free. To me, tis all the same. So what he's saying to Mephistopheles is, how do you want me to sign? I could use a chisel, I could use a pen, I could use a graver, I could use any of these items in order to write my name. Just tell me where to sign and how to do it. Whatever is pleasing to you. And here Mephistopheles actually has a very interesting comeback. He says this, he says, Wherefore thy passion so excite, and thus in thine eloquence inflame? A scrap is for our compact good. Thou undersignest merely with a drop of blood. Very interesting. Mephistopheles wants Faust to sign with a drop of blood. Now, Faust is a good materialist. He's a good scientist. He would fit in very well in our day and age. And as such, Faust thinks this is very silly to sign in blood. Listen to what he says. He said, If this will satisfy thy mind, thy whim I'll gratify, however absurd. So Faust thinks it's absurd to sign his name in blood, whereas Mephistopheles, the Satan figure, actually thinks this is precisely the liquid he wants him to sign in. You see, here's the very important point that is very relevant to our day and age. We're good materialists like Faust. We're scientists, okay? We believe that everything that exists is down here in this world. And so there is no difference between ink, blood, or any other liquid. We can sign in whatever manner that we prefer, and it doesn't matter which liquid is used. However, Mephistopheles is familiar with the spiritual world. He's familiar with the spiritual realm. And he recognizes that there is a special significance to blood itself. Notice his response to Faust. Up until now, we've mostly been getting couplets, maybe four lines or even eight lines at a time from each character. But here from Mephistopheles, he answers Faust with one simple sentence. This is what he says. He says, blood is a juice of a very special kind. That's it. Very interesting quote. Blood is a juice of a very special kind. What Mephistopheles is indicating here is that Faust doesn't recognize the spiritual significance of blood. He doesn't understand the details that this has and what this means echoing up into the spiritual realm. Instead, Faust thinks that everything that exists is just down here in the material realm, and him signing away his soul, whether it be by ink or blood, doesn't matter. But he's dead wrong on this, and Mephistopheles understands the distinction here. 
here he is signing. It's kind of an interesting photograph here. And it's almost as though he could be taking an IV, right? Faust is going and putting his arm out to take an IV. But rather than putting the needle in there, he is putting his quill up to his arm to go ahead and get drops of blood. So then he can go ahead and sign his name. Mephistopheles knew the significance of blood, whereas Faust did not. The reason I'm taking up this theme is because we are looking at blood in today's passage. And in the Bible, the significance of blood is much more in line with Mephistopheles' worldview than it is with Faust's worldview. Why bloody sacrifices? There's a reason that God had all of these bloody sacrifices being offered time and time again all throughout the Old Testament. Blood is not just some irrelevant liquid. It could just be substituted for anything else. It has a very special significance to it. And so I want to start out this sermon by just answering two questions in order to lay the foundation, okay? We're going to answer two questions and lay the foundation, and then after that, we're going to go ahead and proceed and try to apply some of the ideas. But the simple questions I want us to answer are these. What is the significance of blood, and why is it so stressed in the Bible? What is the significance of blood, and why is it so stressed in the Bible? Once we understand this idea, then I want us to jump into blood in particular as it relates to certain biblical themes. Guilt, impurity, and sacrifice. Okay, But just to start out, what is the significance of blood, and why is it so stressed in the Bible? Well, in order to get some understanding of the significance of blood, a passage out of the Old Testament is very helpful. This is Leviticus 17, verses 10 and 11. And here in this passage, we see why blood is significant, especially in verse 11. Look at these verses. If any one of the house of Israel, or if the strangers who sojourn among them, eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. Now here's the significant verse. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by life. Okay, this is a very important concept. You can see blood and life are almost a one-to-one -one correlation in this passage. And that's actually a very helpful concept. I put it this way. It's almost as though blood is symbolic for life itself because it is life manifested in physical or material form. Think of life for a moment. Life is not something that we can actually grasp. We can't weigh it. We can't measure it. And yet we recognize its existence immediately. If life were to take on a physical form or a physical manifestation, that life would look like blood. That's the idea here, okay? Blood is significant because it actually is an indicator of life itself, but in a physical form. So the first thing we need to understand about what is the significance of blood and why is it so stressed in the Bible is that blood and life itself are almost a one-to-one -one correlation. When you see blood, it should remind you of life. And when you see life, blood necessarily exists right along with it. These two things go hand in hand in the Bible. If this is the case, then we can already see some significance of the idea of blood. OK, we can already see some significance of the idea of blood. First of all, blood flows. Think about it. Blood actually flows through the body, constantly moving. OK, and this is indicative of life itself. Life itself is also a flow. Life is something that we are never meant to remain static or rigid. Life itself exists in a flow. And this is a very important concept because if life exists in a flow, then in order for you to do life successfully, you need to be flowing. You need to be moving. I've often seen that our relationship with God, our spiritual walk, is very much like a dance. OK, a dance is something that has flow to it for a moment. Sometimes in the dance, you can't tell really who is leading and who is following such as our relationship with God. There is a dynamic flow to it. It is a dance. Sometimes in your spiritual walk, you're going to feel like God is drawing you in a certain direction and it's going to feel effortless to just follow him. He's clearly leading and you're just observing almost you're almost a passive 
observer in the situation rather than an active participant. You're just seeing what God is doing in your life. That's part of that dance. However, there are other times in our walk where we are very active. It feels like God is not even there and that we're doing all the work. Okay, in these moments, it feels like we're leading the dance. God is there, but we're taking a more active role, an active step in our faith. You must understand this dynamic when it comes to your own spiritual walk. Life is like a flow. Your spiritual life is something that is seamless, a dance back and forth between you and the Spirit of God. And the sooner you recognize and understand this, the sooner you're going to be enabled to be successful in your spiritual walk because you are actually walking in the Spirit in the dynamics of a pure relationship with Him. Another interesting idea about blood, when we compare it to life, is the idea that blood heals. Blood provides nutrients and oxygen to all of the body. Blood has different aspects in it. Platelets to help it clot, white blood cells, red blood cells, plasma. All of these different components make up blood, and utilizing all of these components causes us to heal. Life is very much like this. When there's a cut in our lives, we have the blood rushing out there to help. And we as the church, in a spiritual sense, are meant to be the blood to people out there who can clot when there are problems and who, with white blood cells, can consume problems that enter into all of the blood. Okay, That white blood cell actually attacks all of those you know, negative influences all of the diseases that enter into the blood to try and heal the blood. And so this is a very important picture for understanding what our lives are like when it comes to this relationship of blood and flow. We flow in such a way so that we might heal. Another thing I want you to see about blood is that it is a composite. This is a very important thing to understand. Blood is not just one continuous substance, okay, that is completely homogenous, like you just blended it up and its all characteristics are all the same all the way down. No, blood is a composite. Like I said, it consists of plasma, white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, etc. This is really important because blood at the same time is one thing and many things. Okay, blood preserves unity and diversity all together simultaneously. It preserves it all in one. That's a very important concept and idea because it doesn't actually intermix. It doesn't actually, you know, become just a unity or just a diversity. Blood is a combination unity and diversity. And as a composite, we can see that's an important characteristic for our lives. If you look at the church, the church is meant to be made up of many members. Paul says some are hands, some are eyes, some are brains, some are feet, etc. Okay? However, he says we are all together the body of Christ. The hand can't just run off and say, I have no need of the body. So too, we are the same thing when it comes to blood. It's the same exact picture. We are a composite, both one thing and many things at once. And we need to get that balance in line. Finally, blood constantly transforms, okay? Every 120 days, all of the red blood cells within your body have become regenerated, okay? That is the point. Red blood cells are constantly regenerating because blood itself is constantly transforming. And that's what our lives are meant to be. We are not meant to walk in just a static way. We're not meant to just continue on without ever transforming, without ever changing. Instead, God calls us to constantly be transforming, constantly changing, constantly ascending new heights in our attempt to follow Christ with all of our lives. And so these are all very important pictures for how blood and life relate to us spiritually. Okay, very important idea. But this is not the only aspect about blood that is important, okay? Blood is significant because, yes, it equals life in Leviticus 17.11. However, blood is also significant because it indicates death. Colossians 1.20 actually speaks to this very, very well. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. It says this, and through him, that is Christ, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Note in this verse that blood is associated with the cross, and the cross is associated with death, Jesus' death specifically for atonement for our sins. Now, here 
in this idea that blood is associated with death, we often run into many debates out there in scholarship. Leon Morris, a very well-known Bible scholar, says this. He says, The Old Testament affords no grounds for the far-reaching statements that are sometimes made. Atonement is secured by the death of the victim rather than by the life. This carries over into the New Testament. There, as a sense of death... By violence, excuse me, there as in the Old Testament, blood is more often used in the sense of death by violence than in any other sense. So Leon Morris says, look, if you count the number of verses, you can see that blood is much more often associated with death. So when people are running to Leviticus 17.11 and saying the life is in the blood, they're making a misapplication. Instead, blood has to do with death. Well, you could probably anticipate where I'm going to go with this. I don't think this is an either or, but this is a both and. That's why I put know thy enemy here on the screen. Some Bible scholars like to say, well, blood is life, Leviticus 17.11. And then others, like Leon Morris, like to say, no, blood is death. Count all the verses in the Bible. You'll see more often that blood is associated with death. I do not like pitting these biblical ideas against each other, life versus death. Instead, I see these things as a unified whole. I see these things as two things that complement each other rather than go against each other. And it's at this point that I actually want to utilize this as an illustration. I don't want you to pit life against death when it comes to understanding blood, but I want you to put the two together. Don't fall for simplistic dualisms out there in the world. This is the either-or mindset that contributes to so much tribalism in our day and age. Look back to what I said earlier. The blood is simultaneously a unity and a plurality. Okay, The blood itself exists in both forms at the same time. And I want you to see that when it comes to life or death, understanding of blood, this is not something that we should be pitting against each other, but rather they go together. Here you can see the first framework. Blood, one people say life, another group of people say death. Which is it? We don't know. Instead, I want to propose this. Life and death are both symbolized by blood in the Bible, and they're held together in a perfect unity, in that infinity symbol going around and around and around. This is what I want you to understand, and I think this is very important. Look, in our day and age, especially in the realm of politics, we're so good at fighting against each other and pitting each other, you know, on either side, tribalistically, one against the other. This is not the way forward for God's church. I'm convinced of it. Instead, we need to find the unity in all things. Let me give a perfect example. When it comes to the topic of politics, oftentimes the topic of identity comes up. This is very important in our day and age. Democrats often like to emphasize our group identity. And so your identity is primarily based upon all of your characteristics as they contribute to the collective whole. So you might be male or female, you might be a certain race, gender, all of these different things are contributing to your identity as a whole, okay? And people on the Republican side of the camp like to emphasize individual identity. All of your group identity markers don't matter. Instead, who you are as an individual is what matters, and those things are all secondary. So you often hear people on the conservative side of the fence say things like, I don't see identity markers, right? It's who you are as a person and the contribution you bring that matters. Well, you can probably see where I'm going with this. You are both an individual and members of a group, okay? And multiple groups at that. Both these identity markers matter. You can't get rid of one to the exception of the other. Again, let's go to our illustration of blood. Could you imagine if the plasma was like, eh, I don't need the white blood cells. I don't need the red blood cells. I don't need any of that. I'm going to go off on my own. The plasma would be useless and the rest would become useless. The same goes for the body of Christ. If the hand walked off or the foot walked off or anything like that, said, I have no need for the rest of the body, it would be useless. Instead, we need to integrate these two ideas. Blood equals life and death combined. These concepts together help us to understand the biblical significance of blood. Okay? Don't fall for simplistic dualisms. Instead, embrace the fact that the world is full of opposites. 
And a quote that I love from Ian McGilchrist is that trivial truths always exclude their opposites, but the deepest and most profound truths never do. That's an important concept, okay? The deepest and most profound truths, the pr truths we find in the Bible, don't exclude their opposites, but they subsume them. They include them together. Blood is both life and death in the Bible, okay? Now, if that's the case, then we've essentially answered our first two questions. What is the significance of blood and why is it so stressed in the Bible? Well, the significance of blood is that it is this conglomerate, it is this composite of life and death. This together makes up what blood is all about. This is the twofold understanding. But we now have a follow-up question. And our follow-up question is this. What are the implications of this twofold understanding of blood? Okay, we understand now that blood is life and death in the Bible. That's a symbolic significance. But what are the implications of that? The Bible talks about blood in many different places. And that's where I want to go now. Now that we've laid the foundation, I want us to walk through the ideas of guilt, impurity, and sacrifice as they pop up relatively frequently in the Bible. And I want us to go through these ideas and treat them to have a better understanding of the implications of this twofold understanding of blood. First, let's go ahead and look at the concept of guilt, okay? Blood is equal to guilt in the Bible. And one of the primary areas that I can find this is in Genesis 4.10, okay? Genesis 4.10 is when God approaches Cain because Cain has killed his brother Abel for offering a sacrifice better than his, okay? And if you remember, God speaks to Cain and asks him where his brother is gone. He says, am I my brother's keeper? Not a good phrase if in the Bible, not associated with the hero. So if you ever are tempted to say, am I my brother's keeper? Just know you're quoting the villain, all right? And we can see that God tells him something related to Abel's blood. He says, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, okay? This is what God is saying. It is proclaiming his guilt. His brother's blood has made his guilt very obvious and straightforward. It's something that he should immediately recognize because of the fact that he has slain his brother. And this theme of blood guilt actually persists throughout the rest of the Bible. And in some places, it's associated actually with the guilt of not being concerned for the blood of the poor and the oppressed. Okay, Psalm 72, 14 says this. He's, it's talking about a government official. Okay, those people who are to look out for the blood of the weak and the fatherless and the hopeless, etc., but listen to what it has to say about them. This is a good government official. It says this, For he delivers the needy when he calls, the poor and him who has no helper. He has pity on the weak and needy and saves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence he redeems their life, and precious is their blood in his sight. So you can see here the good ruler, the good leader, the good king actually is concerned about the blood of his people and especially the poor and oppressed. This is something that he actively focuses on. Why? So that the guilt of their blood would not be on his head. There's a passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 33, that talks about the watchman who is watching over the town. God says, I have sent a sword. A flying sword has been thrown at my enemies who are guilty before me. And he says, oh, watchman, if you see me throw my sword and you do not warn the trespasser in his sins that he needs to repent of his sins and put his faith in me, he says he will die in his sins. It's his sins that killed him. However, his blood I will require at your hand. Why? Because you didn't warn him. However, O watchman, if you warn him and tell him the sword is coming and that I have sent judgment because he is guilty and he doesn't do anything about it, then he dies in his sins and his blood is required at his own hand. This is a very important concept because blood with its life and death, unity, twofold understanding, actually often has guilt associated with it. If we look in the Psalms again, we can see in Psalm 9 how there's a whole aspect to this guiltiness that the government isn't able to atone for. If we go into Psalm chapter 9, and I'm going to read here in verses 9 to 12, listen to how 
blood, guilt, is related to now to God when it comes to the oppressed and the needy. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Here's a very important biblical principle for us. Yes, blood has guilt associated with it, but the government officials aren't able to do anything about it. They're too weak. Instead, the Lord shores up the blood guiltiness of the oppressed. Okay, there's another biblical verse that speaks to this specifically. It says, put not your trust in princes. How many people out there in our day and age are putting their trust in princes or in governments? They're trying to trust in all of these programs, all of these societies, all of these cultures to save them. If we get this president, that's going to work. If we get the Supreme Court justice, that's going to work. All of these things are the things that are going to save us. But that's relying upon man to atone for our guilt. Instead, the whole point is, yes, government officials and leaders should atone for the guilt of the innocent, but they're unable to do so. So what we need really is God to atone for our blood guiltiness. That's what we need. We should not be putting our trust in princes or those who are in authorities. Stop trusting in governments. Stop putting all of your hope and faith in them. Instead, put your hope and faith in God. And what specifically for? For atonement. So many people out there are seeking for their own atonement. They want to atone for their own sins. They think they can do it. They think they can get rid of their own guilt. How popular is it in our day and age that people will say things like, stop putting guilt on me or stop shaming me? right? They don't like that pressure being put on them because it makes them feel bad about themselves. And so what they try to do is silence the people who would say that they're living immorally. But in reality, that's not the answer. The answer instead is to recognize you can't atone for yourself and you need to come to Christ and he can forgive you of all of your sins, washing your guilt away. So guiltiness in the Bible is a very important idea associated with blood, and it's the blood of Jesus that can atone for our sins, that washes away our guilt. Not only that, however, let's move on to the next point that I have here, and that's the idea of impurity, okay? If you think about it, there are a lot of Old Testament laws that have to do with blood guiltiness, okay? There are laws against eating blood in the Old Testament. Okay, I'll just read that for you. If you're taking notes, you can write it down. It's Genesis 9-4. And Genesis 9-4 seems to indicate that after the flood, we're now allowed to eat animals, but there's a specific point here made about how to eat them, okay? Verse 3. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you, and as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, the blood. Okay, so you can see here, life is in the blood. And it's actually very interesting because this theme persists into the New Testament. In the book of Acts, Acts 15.29, the Jerusalem Council gets together because they're trying to figure out how to bring Jews and Gentiles together under a banner of Christ. How can these two people groups get along together in the church? Well, rather than imposing a bunch of strictures upon the Gentiles, instead they ask the Gentiles to observe a few things. Now, a couple of these things are straightforward and obvious. We would agree with them. But a couple of the things that the Gentile church is asked to observe is kind of counterintuitive. Listen to what is said here in Acts chapter 15. And let's look at starting in verse 27. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burdens than these requirements. Four things. Listen to what they say. First, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols. Okay, that seems to make sense. But notice the second one. And from blood. Abstain from blood. Why? That's pretty weird. The third thing, and from what has been strangled. That is also pretty weird. And then finally, and from sexual immorality, if you keep yourself from these, you will do well, farewell. So 
in order to have the Gentile church get along well with the Jewish church, what they essentially say is, hey, just keep these four rules. Now, the reason these rules are given is not because they're the moral standards for all time. Instead, these rules are given so that the Gentile believers can get along well with the Jewish believers. And so notice they tell them to abstain from the blood because the blood is a very important ritualistic aspect that many of the Jewish believers would have adhered to. Okay, now here we see a very important biblical principle, and that is the idea of adapting to cultures so as not to offend. Notice that the authors here weren't trying to criticize the Jews and say, oh, that doesn't matter anymore. That's not important. No, instead, they said, let's put aside our differences. Let's put aside those minor issues, the secondary or tertiary matters of the faith. And instead, let's just focus on the primary matters. All right. Don't stir up your brother into a situation where he would be offended. Right. Paul says, if eating meat causes my brother to stumble, I'll become a vegetarian all the days of my life. Why? Because he's looking out for the good of the other. He is truly loving like Christ loved. Now, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is these are the important aspects when it comes to all of these impurity laws in the Old Testament. OK, if you if an animal dies and gets blood on you, you have to leave the camp. Right. And you have to camp outside and stay out there all by yourself. A lot of people might look at a situation like this and say, what's going on? Of course, also, the Bible seems to indicate that you have a, a woman who's in her monthly cycle also has to go outside the camp. What's going on here? It's not that this is sinful. It's not that this is something that God is just against and we must stop. Instead, this is a marker of uncleanness because of the life-death aspect that blood has symbolically significant. OK, this is very important to recognize. And so all of these strictures and rules on going outside of the camp are indications for us that we need to recognize the significance of blood in this way. The point is that all of these laws are symbolic and they were meant to help us to see the significance of the blood of Christ being shed on our behalf. So I have a couple of things I want you to take away just from this understanding of all of these impurity laws. OK, first, don't wave your knowledge of biblical ideas in other people's faces. OK, my understanding of the Bible and the Old Testament indicates that all of these blood related laws in the Old Testament have been fulfilled by Christ and taken on a greater spiritual significance. That's my understanding. However, if I'm running into Christian believers who struggle with this idea, don't wave it in their face. Be patient with them. OK, wait for them and help them to catch up to where you're at. But if they're not comfortable with that, that's OK. What's it to you to abstain from blood? It's not that big a deal. OK, so you're keeping the love of the other in mind. The other thing I want you to see is please don't get too hung up on Old Testament types. So many Christians in our day and age are constantly arguing over the significance of the Old Testament laws. And they'll argue whether these ones are in play or those ones are in play, etc. I want you to not get too hung up on these. And instead, I want you to focus on the greater symbolic significance that they have, especially on those Old Testament laws related to blood. However, I want you to follow your conscience in this matter, okay? Don't just say, well, Tanner says it's okay, so therefore I'm going to do it. Instead, I want you to take what I'm saying, be like a Berean, and study the scriptures to see if these things are true. And if your conscience is transformed by the scriptures, then move forward with this understanding. However, always follow your conscience in this regard. Paul says it's never right to go against conscience, and I don't want you to do so either. OK, this is very important to understand when it comes to impurity. Finally, let's look at the theme of sacrifice. OK, and the theme of sacrifice is going to bring us right back here to the book of Hebrews. All right. I know I've been kind of going thematically or topically on the idea of blood throughout the Bible, but I want to return and end our time here in Hebrews 9. And I want to look specifically at verses 12 to 14. And then after that, verses 18 to 22. OK, Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctified for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
You can see here that sacrifice is this third idea that blood is indicating. It's focusing on the concept of sacrifice. And you can see that there's an argument from the lesser to the greater. We use the animal blood to purify things here in the world. Okay, You purify the basin, you purify the altar, you purify all of these things on earth. Okay, But that's an indicator that Jesus, when he sacrifices his blood, is going to purify the heavenly things, the spirit or the soul of you. The blood of bulls and goats can't atone for your sins. These are all spiritual problems and ideas. Okay, Animals can shed blood for the flesh, the purification of the flesh, because they have blood just like us. But because they don't have the soul like man does, they can't shed the blood for man's soul that's necessary in the heavenly places. That's where Jesus comes into play. So there's this contrast with the blood of animals with the higher blood of Christ. The blood of animals purify things here on the earth, whereas the blood of animals and of Christ purify in the heavens. And this purification theme is picked back up in verse 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all of the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay, this purified with blood idea. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. This is what Passover indicated. This is what so many of the Old Testament themes were indicating as well. You can see here a very important picture. We just were showing the outside of the camp idea of blood. In the Old Testament. Well, here we have Jesus shedding his blood outside of the camp as well. You can see on Golgotha, Jesus goes up the mountain, away from the city, outside of the camp, estranged from his people, and he sheds his blood there on our behalf for our sins. He is put away so that we can be set free. And this sacrifice concept is so key and essential. You see, at the end of the day, the blood of bulls and goats was not taking away the sins of the people. In fact, in chapter 10, it will indicate that it was merely a reminder of sins for the people. Let me just read a few verses to you. Hebrews 10.4 For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Or Hebrews 10.11 Every priest stands daily at the service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. I want you to know in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats was never meant to atone for sins. It was meant to purify the flesh and be a reminder of sins that we need to be purified in our spirit and our soul eternally by a sacrifice greater than these. That was the whole point and the whole significance of it the entire time. And the whole reason we have these impurity laws in the Old Testament, those had to go outside the camp because they were impure through the shedding of blood and Jesus goes outside of the camp to purify all for whom he sheds his blood. This is such an important concept. At the end of the day, guys, the whole reason we gather together in Christian circles is because we are looking forward to the redemption of our bodies that we might enter into heaven. And through repentance and faith, we can actually apprehend to Christ, grab onto him and be with him in the heavenly realms. But the question really is, is that what we're going to do? The whole reason we gather together as Christians, the whole reason we pray, the whole reason we read our Bibles, the whole reason we meditate upon the words of God, the whole reason we are sanctified by the power of the Holy Spirit, all of this is so that we can come into union with God through Christ. And that's the entirety of the point. That's everything that he's trying to do for us. And that's everything that he has done for us. But the real question is, are we going to see this life and death motif with blood? And are we, instead of trying to atone for our own guilt, going to lean onto Christ who atoned for us? We are impure, sent outside the camp. Jesus comes outside the camp, sacrifices himself. His blood metaphorically drips upon us, making our garments white as snow.
I have one final passage that I'd like to read to you guys here just to close. And this is Romans 5, 9 to 10. Just listen to these words. Since therefore, excuse me, since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we will, were, excuse me, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And that's the opportunity that we have in Christ. He gives all of us the opportunity to be saved by him if we will only repent and believe. Father God, we thank you for your word, and I pray that you would guide and direct our steps and cause us to see the significance of the blood of Christ shed on our behalf to turn away from sins and to turn towards you, the living God, in repentance and faith. Save our souls. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I hope that was helpful for you guys. Now it's been included. And so hopefully, Lord willing, we won't miss a single sermon throughout Hebrews like we did in Ecclesiastes. Appreciate you all very much. Thanks for all your love and support. Take care. God bless. Bye.